The night was painted an eerie crimson as we arrived in the small European village. The rare lunar event known as the Red Moon hung heavily in the sky, casting an ominous glow over everything. We were an elite Navy SEAL team, dispatched in response to a sudden surge of brutal attacks and mysterious deaths in the village. The locals whispered that the Red Moon had awakened ancient predators, such as werewolves and wendigos, that had long been dormant in the surrounding forests. Our mission was clear. Protect the village and eliminate the threat. We fortified the village, employing every tactic and weapon at our disposal. Yet, as the first howls echoed through the still night air, we understood that our military training had not prepared us for this. The cryptids were cunning, a deadly cat and mouse game ensuing as we attempted to hunt them down. They were unlike any enemy we had ever faced. Creatures of nightmare and legend brought to life by the chilling light of the red moon. During our pursuit, we discovered an ancient artifact hidden within a nearby cave. It was a relic from a bygone era, pulsating with a power that seemed to resonate with the cryptids. We soon realized that this artifact held the ability to control these creatures a revelation that opened our eyes to a far greater threat. A sinister cult, shrouded in the darkness of the forest, sought to harness this power. They planned to use the red moon and the artifact to awaken and control the predators for their own dark purposes. The stakes were suddenly far higher than we could have imagined. We were not just fighting for the survival of a village, but the entire world. We devised a plan to secure the artifact and defeat both the cult and the cryptids. The, it was a dangerous gambit, one that pushed us to our limits and beyond. We fought through the night, the eerie glow of the red moon casting long shadows as we engaged in a desperate battle against the cult and the fearsome cryptids. The air was thick with the scent of blood and fear, and we could hear the snarls and howls of the creatures as they closed in on us. With the artifact in our possession, we could feel its power surging through us urging us to take control of the cryptids. But we knew that the price of such power was too high, that we could not allow ourselves to become like the cult that sought to exploit it. Instead, we used the artifact to weaken the connection between the cryptids and the Red Moon, disrupting the cult's control over them. As we fought our way through the cult's ranks, we were forced to confront the very essence of darkness that they worshipped. But we held strong, our resolve unwavering, and with each member of the cult we defeated, we drew closer to ending their twisted plans. Finally, as dawn broke on the horizon and the Red Moon's grip on the world began to fade, we emerged victorious. The cult was dismantled, their dark purpose thwarted. The cryptids, now free from the influence of the artifact and the Red Moon, retreated into the depths of the forest, their primal rage subsiding. We had accomplished our mission protecting the village and preventing global chaos. Yet, the experience had left its mark on each of us, a reminder of the darkness that lurked just beyond the boundaries of our understanding. As we left the village behind, we knew that we had witnessed something truly extraordinary, a glimpse into a world where the line between myth and reality was blurred. As we returned to our normal lives, the memory of that fateful night under the red moon remained etched in our minds, a testament to the strength and courage of those who dare to face the unknown. And though we could not predict what other mysteries lay waiting in the shadows, we knew that we would be ready to confront them when the time came. I'll start out by saying that the small town where I grew up and where all of my family still resides is in Monroe County, Ohio, maybe 20 minutes or so outside of Wheeling, West Virginia. So I was talking to my dad on the phone the other night. He told me that last week while driving home from work, he came across something he can't explain. His voice was shaky, unlike I have ever heard him. He works the night shift at a local coal mine. And while driving home from work, early one morning around 5.30 a.m., he noticed a large creature crouched down in the road. It had bright red glowing eyes that looked directly at him. He said this creature also had very large wings which were wrapped around it as it crouched. He said he had never in his life seen anything like this. It had really upset him. 
he proceeded to drive by it. But when he looked behind him, it was gone. He said that he was actually scared to get out of his car when he got home in fear, that perhaps it had followed him or was even in his car. After a few very tense minutes, he slowly got out of the car. There was nothing there. I asked him if he had ever heard of the Mothman. He kind of paused, then said that he had never heard of it until he started talking to people about what he had seen. He said that they would say right away, it sounds like you saw the Mothman. You hear weird stories all the time. And because you don't really know the person who witnessed it, you just shrug it off. Knowing my dad and what a logical thinker he is, I believe he encountered something supernatural. He is usually the one who tries to come up with logical answers for things that are otherwise unexplained. He's very skeptical when it comes to aliens, UFOs, ghosts, etc. For me to talk to him and hear him tell me about this Mothman-like creature was shocking. For this is not like my father. I will say that I am concerned. For what I understand is that when a person actually witnesses a Mothman, oftentimes bad things happen afterward. There isn't a doubt in my mind that what he saw was 100% true. It has completely made a believer out of me when it comes to the Mothman. I hope for the sake of my father and my family that that isn't true and that he made a mistake of identity. On time samples, on size and percent. I saw the Mothman as it flew over my school bus and I think it was winter of 1966. The school bus driver, Odell Wallace and I were the last ones on the bus, as we had already dropped off all the other kids and were headed toward the end of the school bus route on Big 16 Mile Creek in Mason County. I lived another mile past that. I would walk in the morning to the bus and home from it in the evening, and it flew over the bus and was no more than 100 feet above us, and we could see that the wingspan of this thing was about the length of the bus. After it flew over, I looked up into the mirror that the driver used to watch the kids as he drove. He was looking back at me, and I said, Did you see that? He just looked at me and nodded and nothing else was said. I haven't told too many people about this for fear of ridicule and joking bull, but now I'm 65 years old, and I don't care what anybody says. I know what I saw was not anything normal. I'm a hunter also. Deer hunter, rabbit, squirrel, groundhog, or anything else I can eat that doesn't have antibiotics and human footprints in it, and I've never before seen anything like it. And not since, even though I'm always in the woods. So I know that the dang thing existed, or still exists. If you've been deep woods camping all alone out, is the emptiness, that is what is creepy. No car horns or engine noise, chatter or children, neither hustle or bustle, just the wind and the quiet at night. Leaves don't rustle in the calm and sticks don't crack in the absence of the weight of someone or something coming and going, just pure quiet. You look up at the sky and see an ocean of stars, sometimes flickering, and realize that millions of people can't see them because of city lights or pollution. There is no common connection being had unless you gaze at the moon and even then the doubts cloud you mind. It's two days to hike to the nearest landmark and you aren't sure if you want to head back because you aren't sure if the world has ended and you are the last person alive. You strain your senses to hear, to see, to touch another person, but they are all gone. They're all gone. Late 70s, my dad and his buddies went trekking out in northern Siberia in late fall. Being several days from the nearest village, the likeliness of encountering other humans was extremely unlikely. Having set camp for the night, about a week into their journey, the party started a campfire. About halfway through the night, the guy watching noticed two figures approaching the camp from the woods. It was two guys wearing prison fatigues, a thing, was nearest gulag-type facility was at least 200 kilometers away. My dad's buddy pulled a rifle on them and asked them to stop. They asked if they could warm themselves by the fire, so dad's friend woke everyone up. They stayed for around a half hour on dad and co-fed them some food. The two guys started getting anxious and after about an hour decided it was time to leave. They left into the dark forest and my dad didn't ever hear about them again. 
In the morning, they tried to follow their tracks, but the heavy snowfall had made search impossible. I had been told of a good fishing spot on the Roaring River by a friend. My buddy and I left a car at the Roaring River campground and drove up the Little North Fork Guard skirting. The ridge above the river, we drove to the end and walked a trail down to the river, about one half miles. We figured we were six, seven miles from the campground. We got to the river at about 9 a.m. while walking down the river for about four or five hours fishing. My buddy and I came across a wide bend in the river fairly deep 15 feet or so. There was a mud trail coming out of the water, as if we had scared someone or thing when we arrived at the site. There was a trail of wet sand and footprints, leaving the water and into heavy brush. We looked at the prints and were stunned at their length. They were a size 1718. Two of the prints were extremely clear. At the time, we thought we were close to the campground, so we didn't think much of it. We didn't reach the campground till nearly dark. A few months later, there was an article in the Oregonian by Phil Sanford who wrote a column regularly about a sighting by two women from Oregon City at the Roaring River campground area. It's late at night at round 12, so close to an hour ago as of posting. I live in Arkansas and outside city limits, but not too far into the woods. I still have neighbors. I was playing on my phone when I heard the sound of a primate outside my house from inside my room. Years ago, my dad had told me he heard something similar, like he heard what sounded like an ape in the woods one day. I never believed him. I'm not sure what kinds of animals could make sounds similar to that type of animal. This is an account of what myself and a friend witnessed on May 15, 1997. We were sitting at the river's edge on the Malala River near the logging bridge, which is near the train trestle and the old Malala Forest Road. There were a bunch of young people partying just before we got there and had left a big mess. Two nice people stayed behind. We chatted with them for a while and started hearing small noises in the woods about 50 yards behind us. The four of us figured it was the police checking things out, so it was about 9.30 p.m. at this time, and the two people who stayed behind decided to leave because it was getting late. About one minute after they left, I was taking a leak over by the bridge and heard a large thrashing sound going through the water. Needless to say, I did not stick around and know it was in no way a deer, elk, or bear because I have been an avid hunter for years. My friend, however, is a little fearless at times, so he decided to go take a look. And this is what he saw, following the sound going across the water. My eyes focused on an area about 10 feet from the far bank of the river. The area was a swift moving rapid that was about five feet deep. In the moonlight, I saw a figure crossing the river as it lunged through the water that was only waist deep on it. The figure was a person because of the immense size of it. It was about as wide as two good-sized men and the five-foot deep water only arose slightly over its waist. As it disappeared into the woods, we could hear the sound of large limbs being snapped like twigs. It was about then that we decided to leave the scene. I was nine. My brother was ten. My family was coming back from a cross-country trip. My dad was asleep and my mom was driving. My brother was asleep, and I just started to wake up. The sun had just came up and light was pouring through the valley. We came around a bend slowing down a little, and I heard my mom curse. We thought it was a hitchhiker at first, crouched down by the side of the road. But as we got closer, it turned and looked at us, stood up and with one stride disappeared into the forest. It was big, easy eight half to nine feet, covered in light brown hair. The eyes were so big and dark. I just cried. I was terrified. One speeding ticket later, we're home. We lived in Mill City at the time. On a rowing team, coach couldn't get off work, so it fell to me to direct practice. Steady state, long, slow, maintainable pace for a long time. Up the river to the Lake Erie appropriately. Four rowers and myself. 
all of them facing backwards with me steering and directing them. We leave from Toledo, north down the Maumee, which is a shipping corridor. By the time we passed the last Biwoy, there were no lights ahead late afternoon practice. Late fall, clouds, light drizzle, and there was nothing but a black wall to look forward at. Our bow light threw off too little light to really see by just enough to be seen. Given that our team had discovered corpses on every other attempt at this row, we were expecting to see some shit. Not seeing anything was equally disturbing, though, and it was getting late, so we turned around. Now, the rowers got to stare into the blackness. This prompted scary stories. Good ones were shared, and finally we had light again. The mood lightened. All of a sudden, off to starboard, we all see something leaving a ripple. Descriptions all agreed it was round in shape, supported by a thin stem leading into the water, presumably to a larger body. It followed us for maybe 30 meters, then dropped into the water without a trace. No splash, just the trailing ripple it had behind its stem. Five of us saw the same thing. No one said a word until it was gone. Still have no idea what it was. I packed into Hammersley Wild area in upstate Pennsylvania a few years ago with a friend. I brought along a new set of Motorola walkies, and after we set up camp, my buddy decided to hike up to the ridge behind us so we could mess around with them. He was about three quarters of the way up and long out of sight of me, when he keyed his radio to say something. At the exact same time, I heard what sounded like a loud growl or roar from off in the distance. There was a bit of delay on my walkie-talkie, and then I heard the growl come over the speaker, followed by my buddy saying WTF was that. He came back down in a hurry. No idea what made the sound, but it was eerie as hell. Another night in the same area, we had a pack of coyotes circling our tent and howling like banshees. Not much sleep was had that night. I witnessed a bizarre creature run across my driveway. I own 14 acres of woodland, and I am also surrounded by forest just outside of Oxford, Connecticut. I was driving down my driveway when a bipedal creature about four feet tall and about as wide as my thigh ran out of the woods to my left, across my driveway and into the woods and yard of the property on the right. It was about 10 yards away from me, so I got a good look at it. It looked like a tree on legs with small arms. No visible curves, hips, or shoulders, just straight. It was brown, skinny with no fur or hair, lightning fast, and light as a feather. Almost looked like it wasn't even touching the ground. I didn't hear a sound from it, running, and all the birds and other animals were dead silent. When it ran, it didn't prance like most animals or run like a human. Its legs were moving as if you were pedaling a bicycle. I saw the back and a bit of the right side of it. I didn't see the front or a face. I didn't see a tail, ears, or any other body parts a normal animal or human would have. About two months ago, I was outside around 10 p.m., and there were two owls hooting back and forth. Then I heard this god-awful screeching sound wasn't a fisher cat or screech owl. I have no idea if that was related or not. I don't do drugs and I was not drinking. I am not on any medication or anything like that. I don't know what if it was for sure an alien, but I don't know what else it could be. I did not see any craft or anything, although I wasn't going to walk through the woods to look either. I was riding with my good friend in his 1970s Land Cruiser Jeep. We wanted to go out in 4x4 four four in the snow, as I had traveled over to John Day from Salem, where it never snows. The snow was coming down in a torrent, bringing visibility to a minimum, but we were just creeping along a logging road through about 12 inches of snow. As we rounded a bend in the road, we came to an open area where they stack fallen logs and Bigfoot leapt out in front of the vehicle. It stopped for a second and faced us, then jumped off the road to the other side. My friend yelled, Oh my God, what was that? We jumped out of the vehicle, and I had my 9mm Daywood pistol with me. When I jumped out, I set the box of bullets on the hood. We walked forward to where it had jumped out and saw the footprints around 16, 18 inches long fresh in the deep snow. My friend shined his flashlight in it, and you could make out the toes. 
It was snowing so hard that they were already beginning to fill in, and we looked at each other, and panic overcame us. My friend shouted, oh my god, what if we get snowed in? We have to get out of here. He screamed this, and I was overcame with panic. I started to fire my pistol into the air and emptied the clip. I turned to run back to the vehicle and grab my box of bullets off the hood, and they were gone. Just an indentation in the snow on the hood where I set them. No slide marks. They were just gone. We drove out of there in a panic. It wasn't until we got out onto the main Bear Creek Road that we started to calm down. And later we asked each other what happened. Why were we scared? Normally this would not have frightened us. We were 18, 19 and had no fear. I can hardly believe what I'm about to recount, but I swear that every word is true. It all began after a violent thunderstorm had swept through Yosemite National Park, leaving the once serene landscape changed in ways that would forever haunt me. As a park ranger named Joseph, my duty was to protect and care for the park's natural beauty. After the storm, I noticed something peculiar in a specific area of the park. The pine trees emitted an eerie, otherworldly sound, like a chorus of mournful whispers. It sent shivers down my spine, but I assumed it was merely a consequence of the storm's fury. One night, I found myself patrolling that very area, drawn by a strange curiosity that I couldn't shake off. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the air grew thick with an unnatural silence broken only by the haunting melody of the pine tree's unsettling symphony. My flashlight pierced through the darkness, revealing gnarled roots and damp leaves underfoot. And then, there it was, an unknown cryptid stumbling and waddling through the shadows. The sight of it made my stomachs churn with fear and disgust. The creature's movements were awkward, dragging its leg ever so often as it shuffled forward. The glimpse I caught of its facial features made me cringe and shudder. Its face, if I could even call it that, appeared male, but it was disfigured and ghastly skinny. The jaw seemed to hang unnaturally, giving it a hauntingly macabre appearance. The eye sockets were surrounded by massive bags that made the eyes themselves appear empty and lifeless. The creature's mouth was wide open, looking hollow and void of any humanity. It had no clothes, its deathly skinny form exposed to the elements. The most shocking aspect of the cryptid was its height. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was freakishly tall, towering over anything I had ever seen. Its demeanor and appearance were incredibly dirty, possibly white, but obscured by a layer of filth. As I stood there paralyzed with fear and disbelief, the creature turned its empty gaze toward me. Panic welled up inside me, but before I could react, it lunged at me with surprising speed and strength. Its bony fingers gripped my shoulders, and we tumbled to the forest floor. The impact knocked the breath out of me, and before I could regain my composure, darkness enveloped me. When I regained consciousness, I found myself alone, sprawled on the forest floor. The cryptid was gone, as if it had never been there. I rubbed my throbbing head, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Had I encountered a ghostly apparition, a creature of the dark depths of the forest, or had my mind played tricks on me? Fear mingled with confusion as I stumbled back to my feet, feeling the weight of the encounter pressing on my mind. My heart raced with a mix of disbelief and a primal urge to flee. But when I returned to the park ranger station and reported the incident, my colleagues looked at me skeptically. They assured me that the storm had probably left me disoriented and that what I had seen was likely a figment of my imagination. Yet deep down, I knew the truth. I had encountered something beyond rational explanation, something that existed in the shadows of the world unseen and unheard by most. I'll preface this by saying I now live in Melbourne, Australia, but I lived in California for three years between 2015-2018, and I've got a story. My potential skinwalker encounter was in September 2016. I had finished summiting Mount Whitney, California, and had been doing months of training to do it early in the evening 
When I got back down from the mountain, I went into Lone Pine to get some food and get ready for the drive back to L.A. But before that, I went to the Alabama Hills scenic area just outside town to sit and eat some food and marvel at the 14,000 feet mountain I had just summited with my team. They were still in the town center. As the sun set, I turned to the side and behind a small hill was an old homeless looking man in ragged clothes and grimy hair. He stood there slightly slumped and motionless. Inside my mind, I was shitting myself because to me, something seemed extremely off and my gut feeling was telling me to get out of there. But I tried to stay composed and asked him if he wanted any food or needed anything. He stayed as still as a statue and didn't respond. I gave him a few more options to respond before telling him I'm not staying here any longer. And I started to move back to my car. I hurried up the process quickly and started the engine put my seatbelt on. When I looked back up, the man wasn't there, and instead, it was now a half-deformed-looking coyote, which made an ear-piercing scream, and stood on its hind legs. Would have been six feet, I backed it in reverse, and floored it out of there, and it kept up with me for at least 200 meter hour. I'm pretty much convinced that it was a skinwalker. I know they're technically only in Utah or Arizona, but these things probably don't know what borders are. And I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up in California and Nevada as well. I was at Page Mountain Snow Park with about nine or ten others campers. We were just camping out for the weekend and having a good time. We, while exploring the area on a previous trip, had come across a mine. It was marked with a mine claim paper in a jar hanging from a tall stick in the ground. We went to the Josephine County clerk to find out what other mining claims are in the area with interest in filing a claim ourselves. If an abandoned claim was in the area, it turns out that there are four or five claims directly in front of the cabin. On the night we saw it, we had arrived at the cabin after dark and set up camp. We had a little map of the area this time, and after a few beers around the campfire, we decided, me and three or four other guys, to grab some flashlights and take a look in the woods. The girls stayed back at the cabin and we guys went down the road into Suzuki Samurai. We left the Samurais running with headlights on facing toward us in the cabin. We couldn't see the cabin from there. The woods are very dense and it was a ways off. We were laughing and making a lot of noise as we circled through the dense area. We got almost to the cabin when we decided to turn back and retrieve our rigs, which we couldn't even hear at this point. I personally got a very strange feeling that something was watching us. I began to feel very uncomfortable but didn't say anything. Soon, we were able to hear the Samurai engines running. They were both very loud with exhaust leaks to boot. We ended up making a very wide circle back to the rigs and ended up on a ridge looking down at the Samurai. Probably 50 or 60 feet higher in elevation and maybe 250 feet away. We had to descend a steep slope to arrive at the rigs and we decided to chill out and rest for a minute before we headed down. I lit a cigarette, as did others, and was looking down at the Samaras when something huge and hairy walked between us and the headlights. We all saw it as it first passed in front of my rig, blocking the headlights completely where it stood for just a second, long enough for everyone to see it. Then it passed by the other Samurai in one large step blocking the headlights. All I could really see was that it was furry, brown or black, this I could see in the light of the headlights, but because it was between us and the light, we couldn't make out a shape at all. The only thing we could tell was that it had no fear at all of noisy samurai or the headlights and that it was tall. From where we were standing, it would have to be at least five feet tall to block the headlights from our view. If it were a bear, which is what we all agreed to that night, then why would it walk right past those samurais? Why would it walk in front of them instead of behind them? Why would it be walking upright? I don't know much about bears, but I don't think there are that tall while on all fours. Whatever it was, I'm convinced that it was watching the girls at our cabin when we unexpectedly crashed through the woods, scaring it out. Our decision to suddenly crash through the woods could not have been expected by the creature. We caught it by surprise, but it wasn't running away. It walked away slowly and it didn't know there weren't any people in those rigs. If there had been, then they would have gotten the fright of their life. 
because as I mentioned before, it paused in front of the headlights for a second. We all spent a very scary night at the cabin. We didn't let this experience run us off, but we all felt like we were being watched as we slept. We all agreed that it was a bear and didn't discuss it again for a few years until the other night one of my friends, who was with us that night, told me, out of the blue, that he thinks it was a Sasquatch. Well, since he said it first, I agreed. But none of us have discussed that night since. I was deer hunting on the east slope of a very steep hillside and saw movement about 70 yards down and away from me. I started to bring my rifle up, but realized it was too dark and tall to be a deer. I saw this thing walk through the trees, and even though it was very dry and crunchy in the woods, it made no sound. I saw it walk very briskly for about 40 yards, and then turn down the slope and out of sight, also noticed. The following day, in an area a few miles away, we found unusually large dung piles for low very remains, and my hunting partner and I thought they were from a very big, and even then thought it would be difficult for a bear to pass such a large diameter stool 